from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology coming up. In the next hour, end of an era, as Jeff Bezos gets ready to step down from Amazon next week, we will talk about his legacy at the company that has reshaped how we think about buying anything and everything. Plus, natural gas field now fueling Bitcoin. We'll talk about mining and its environmental problems with a key player on the Texas prairies. And medical care from the air. Drones debut as a critical way to deliver life-saving blood, vaccines, and more. We'll talk to the CEO of Zipline about redefining the global supply chain. All those stories in a moment, but first, U.S. stocks advancing after the latest jobs figures jumped the most in 10 months. Our Kriti Gupta has more. Kriti, finally, some good news. Absolutely, Emily. After two months of disappointing jobs reports, you had a positive payrolls number, and that actually helped the S&P 500 close 0.8%. Now, of course, we do have extremely low volume ahead of that holiday weekend, so you did see stocks be a little bit on cruise control, but I just want to show you the disparity here between those tech stocks up 1.2% on the day and small caps and cyclical down 1% on the day. So you are really seeing the defensive tone really take a bit. Now, before I show you other of the subsectors of tech, I really want to highlight what Didi did, because, of course, we have that IPO really in the spotlight right now. Of course, after that 1% gain on their debut, they had another solid number of gains, but then today was their first down day after those first two sessions. So let's just see if that momentum really keeps up in this kind of light trading environment, which brings me to what the other subsectors of tech are doing. So, of course, you had the IPO IPO names actually drop 0.3%. So that DD picture is just part of that broader move. Sox are doing pretty well, of course, in line with that NASDAQ outperformance. But then even to the downside, remember that time of last year when we had tech really be that bundle trade? It meant that everything within tech was doing well. Not the case anymore. Those Chinese ADRs, very tech heavy, down 1.9%. And of course, you have those NASDAQ biotechs not in on that positive tech trade, Emily. So that's the macro picture. Let's get to more of the micro with Ed Ludlow. Yeah, I'm taking a look at Disney. You can actually see on my screen, basically flat at Friday's close. We saw a big drop during the session on a report from the information that Disney Plus subscriber growth slowed in the first half of the year. They, they cited internal data, which Disney basically refuted. If you look at the trading over the last few days, you can see what it did. It caused pretty significant drop on a day where the shares had been higher. This is what I'm talking about over here. Disney spokesperson says the information contains factual inaccuracies that do not reflect the performance of the service. Nonetheless, investors paying attention. I'm also keeping an eye on Amazon, up 2.3%, its biggest gain since March 9th. Why? Not much news out there. But it's Jeff Bezos' last day, last weekday as CEO before he hands over to Andy Jassy, before he becomes executive chair. And I've got a chart for you, Emily. Come with me into my Bloomberg terminal and look at this. That white line, you probably don't even recognize it, but it's the S&P 500, a mere 420% gain since 1997 when Amazon IPO'd at $18 a share. Since then, we got some stock splits, but it's up more than 200 and 20,000 percent. I'm not making that up. That's real. It's on the chart. You can see it. Incredible legacy that he leaves behind. A tough act to follow. But come back to me in the studio because let's bring it back down to earth. Get it? Amazon trailing the NYSE Fang Plus Index, that broader basket of mega cap tech stocks. So when Andy Jassy gets to his desk next week, well, he's got a big job on his hands. Emily. Ed laughed out loud about five times during that hit. Thanks so much for that. Our Ed Ludlow walking us down memory lane, staying with Amazon this upcoming Monday marks Jeff Bezos, his last day as CEO of Amazon. For more on his legacy, I want to bring in Bloomberg's Matt Day, who has been covering the company for us from Seattle. So, gosh, Matt, I mean, where do we start with a guy who changed the world for better or for worse, what happens on Monday? Are you expecting any fanfare, any sort of ceremony as this passing of the baton happens or not? So Amazon hasn't said much about what they plan to do. You know, my expectation would be Andy Jassy introduced himself to the troops. Maybe that's an internal email. Maybe it's an internal video. Um, but there's really, it would, it would take a whole lot to kind of mark, you know, the 27 years that, uh, that Bezos has had in charge of that company. As Ed said, it's an insane run. 
reshaped online shopping, invented it for all intents and purposes uh, for much of the United States. Um, so it's a heck of a run, and Andy takes over on uh, on Monday. And Jeff, of course, is becoming executive chair or staying on as executive chair, I should say. So he's not necessarily going anywhere. How much do you think he's going to still be trying to be in that driver's seat and, and allowing Andy to have that have that role? It's, that can be a tough transition. You know, you saw this with Microsoft and Bill Gates staying involved as kind of a technical advisor over Steve Ballmer's shoulder. Um, Jeff Bezos has said he wants to stay involved in new projects at Amazon. He's called out worker safety as something he wants to keep working on and trying to invent new ways to, to keep employees safe. Um, but Jeff Bezos is also about to blast himself off into space um, here in a couple of weeks. So I, I don't think he's going to be looking over uh, Andy Jassy's shoulder every day, uh, but certainly wants to tell investors that he's staying involved and wants to keep a hand in the company he founded. And of course, huge milestone coming up for Jeff Bezos, where he's planning to to fly into space on July 20th. But Richard Branson trying to beat him to the punch and, and has scheduled uh, his own rocket ship ride for about a week from now. Do you think that's um, that's getting under Bezos' skin at all? You know, they haven't had quite a spirited rivalry. I think it would get really tough if Elon Musk were to jump into the fray and say he wanted to go into space. That's a guy who has shared some words with uh, Jeff Bezos over the years about differing approaches to space travel and their, their rivalry and all that. All right. Well, we're going to talk about that a little bit more later in the show and, and Branson's mission itself. But how are employees feeling about this? Are they excited? Are they apprehensive? I think it's a lot of a lot of business as usual is what Amazon's trying to portray. You know, you talk to employees, a lot of them just don't know Andy Jassy. He's been off running Amazon Web Services, the cloud computing group, for the last 18 years. A lot of rank and file inside Amazon's retail group, inside its warehouses, have never you know met the guy, have never had cause to interact with him very much at all. So Amazon's really got an opportunity to introduce him to a lot of the workforce. Um, you know, in public, I think we're certainly going to hear a lot of the same things Jeff Bezos has said. A lot of references to to keeping shoppers happy and and kind of staying focused. Talk to us about what's going to be priority number one on Andy Jassy's agenda. That's a great question. I think Andy Jassy has a tougher plate coming in than maybe Jeff Bezos did. Bezos was building from nothing he could kind of invent in a, in a, in a shoebox here. Andy Jassy's got a lot of constituencies to satisfy. You know, the company is on a roll financially, but is under the gun um, for antitrust reasons in the U.S. and Europe. Um, Andy Jassy has to do a lot of messaging to a lot of constituencies. Uh, it's, it's not just the the pure customer focus that Amazon's you know management style might prefer and might really want to talk about. Andy Jassy's got a lot more balancing to do as he takes the reins. All right. Matt Day for us in Seattle. You'll continue to hold down the fort through the transition and beyond. Thanks so much, Matt, for your insight there. Meantime, IBM President Jim Whitehurst will be stepping down after a three-year tenure at Big Blue, sending shares tumbling. The move comes unexpectedly, but signals one of the first major reshuffles under CEO Arvind Krishna, who took the reins of the company last year. Whitehurst was the CEO of Red Hat, which IBM bought for $33 billion in 2018 in a deal orchestrated by Krishna. All right, coming up, we'll speak to the CEO of Crusoe Energy about how the company is capturing flare gas from oil patches to power crypto mining. Chase Lockmiller with us next. This is Bloomberg. Bitcoin fundamentals put to the test this week as investors all kept an eye on that crucial $30,000 threshold. The cryptocurrency fell below last week. We're going to have to see what the weekend holds for price action. Bitcoin now trading about $33,000. We'll keep an eye on it. Staying on top of crypto, Crucio Energy is on a mission from Montana, North Dakota and beyond. The company capturing excess natural gas and harnessing it to power data centers and crypto mining operations. Some believe this is evidence of crypto mining not necessarily being bad for the environment, but in fact, incredibly efficient. Let's find out more if there's any truth to that with Crusoe Energy CEO Chase Lockmiller joining us now. So Chase, where do you stand on the crypto environmental mining debate? Bill Gates, Elon Musk have concerns, but when you talk to folks deep in the industry, they say that's a red herring. 
I think that's right. I, you know, cr crypto mining can actually be used uh, as, as a huge benefit to promote uh, very beneficial infrastructure and capture otherwise wasted energy resources like natural gas that gets flared in the oil field. Um, it's also, you know, very useful to uh, unlock value in otherwise stranded renewable energy resources um, that are generating power capacity that, that doesn't have a home to actually be consumed. Um, so when you look at the actual global footprint of uh, Bitcoin mining energy consumption, uh, it's shocking. It's shockingly driven uh, by, by a lot of these wasted energy resources. And we, when we say mining, we really mean a bunch of engineers and computers uh, running very complex math problems, trying to solve those problems to mine, mine that cryptocurrency. Talk to us about what Crusoe is in fact doing. How are you using some of this excess energy to power these mining operations? Sure, so Crusoe has a solution called digital flare mitigation. And what it does is we, uh, you know, in the oil industry, um, there's, this some, there's something that happens called flaring. And flaring persists when oil companies drill oil wells um, and natural gas is an associated byproduct of that oil production. And when they don't have the physical infrastructure to transport that gas to a downstream market where it can actually be consumed, um, they're sort of stuck in this situation where the best, most economic uh, and most efficient thing to do with it is to just light it on fire. Um, and this actually creates a massive emissions footprint um, and, and, a, and a massive waste of an otherwise you know, useful uh, energy resource. So Crusoe's solved that problem uh, by basically co-locating uh, data centers on site with the oil production. And now instead of the gas being flared, we're able to uh, uh, utilize it to generate power and then utilize that power to power data centers that we use for very energy intensive computing applications like Bitcoin mining, uh, training large scale artificial intelligence algorithms and uh, you know, generating, uh, you know, rendering for, for, for uh, graphics and animation development. I, I'm curious what the conversation was like when you asked oil operators and ranchers and farmers if you could move servers onto their property to mine Bitcoin, which um, some people might not even know what Bitcoin is. Sure, it was uh, it was definitely a, a, a leap um, for them, but you know they they I think for the, as a whole the industry has been very very receptive to the idea, uh, largely because you know they see it as a solution to flaring. Uh, you know, I think, I think the response early on from a number of operators was, you know, I don't really care what you're doing with the gas so long as you're sort of making my flare go away. Um, that's a huge environmental win for me. Um, and it's a huge benefit to my overall production process. So talk to us about how big your operations are. Uh, we mentioned Montana, North Dakota, you're expanding in Texas. That's correct. Um, so currently we've deployed about 45 systems, um, primarily in North Dakota and Montana. Um, we're expanding, uh, so that area is called the Bakken. Um, it's one of the largest oil basins here domestically in the United States. Um, and we're planning to expand down into the Permian Basin, which is in West Texas um, later this year. Uh, you know, the team's about 75 people that's, that's sort of geographically dispersed between uh, Denver, San Francisco, uh, and a big field operations staff in, in North Dakota uh, to support our on-site operations. And, uh, you know, that, that's kind of where we're at today. We just closed a, a Series B round of funding, which was led by Valor Equity Partners. And, uh, and we had great participation from other uh, climate tech investor groups like uh, Lower Carbon Capital as well. And also some, you know, crypto-focused folks like Coinbase, the Winklevoss twins, you know, yep. we've seen this big crackdown from China on mining. We're seeing regulatory action being taken in the UK. We're waiting for regulators to take a stand on cryptocurrency here in the United States. What have your conversations with regulators been like? Uh, uh, generally speaking, I think very positive. Uh, I think I think uh, the regulatory climate here in the United States has been, you know, very thoughtful um, around uh, both Bitcoin mining and around flaring. I think. You know, when you look at a state like North Dakota, uh, they're, they're sort of, you know, uh, between a rock and a hard place where, you know, 45% of the state's revenue is generated from the oil industry um, and, and flaring is a big problem and they want to do the right thing. Uh, but if they over-regulate it, you know, they, they kind of outlaw the industry and coming up with, you know, coming to, table with, coming to the table with an innovative solution like digital flare mitigation uh, that can actually create economic value while also reducing the environmental footprint of, of the oil industry. Um, has been very, very well received in markets like that. Um, as far as the China ban goes- And with China goes, cracking down- Sure. 
Well, I guess my question is, where where do you think mining is going to sp spread next? If it's not going to happen in China, is that a huge boon to the United States or elsewhere? Absolutely. I think it's a great thing for the industry as a whole. I think it's a great thing for the Bitcoin network. Uh, one of the big criticisms has always been that uh, the mining process is highly concentrated in China. Um, there's a lot of you know obscurity and uh, opaqueness to that. And with the ban in China, you're seeing that hash rate get distributed around the globe, um, and you're seeing a, a more you know you're seeing the benefits of decentralization. Uh, the network is still continuing to operate, and you're you know you're seeing a massive influx of hash rate to areas like uh, North America. Um, Central Asia is, is is a big beneficiary of this as well. Um, and you know I think it presents a a great opportunity to build a whole new industry domestically here in, in North America. All right, well, we'll keep watching uh, how your process unfolds. Chase Lockmiller of Crusoe Energy, thanks so much for explaining all that to us. All right, coming up, we're going to speak to the CEO of the leading home remodeling and design platform, Howes, about its new pro service co-founder, Adi Tatarko, with us next. This is Bloomberg. Sheltering in place over the last 18 months or so had us all looking at our, well, shelters. And as a result, the demand for home interior design and renovation soared. House, of course, is the leading platform for home renovation and design, providing people with everything they need to improve their homes from start to finish. They recently launched House Pro Business Management Software, which provides an all-in-one software solution for industry pros to stand out. With us now for more, Adi Tatarko, CEO and co-founder of House. Adi, great to have you back here on the show. So I know I've certainly been staring at my own four walls and been motivated to make some changes. What trends did you see through the pandemic and what trends are you seeing now that we're starting to come out of it? Yes, well, these are great questions. So first and foremost, um, before a pandemic, there was four very strong trends and we definitely see them continuing. Um, one was the baby boomers activity. The other one was the aging homes in the US and in other parts of the world that needs, you know, must care and love and repair. Uh, we saw and still see home equity at record high and we're seeing limited housing stock. So now on top of that came COVID and accelerated everything. For a minute, we got a pause, right? Where everybody didn't know what's gonna happen. We all sheltered in place and then it all accelerated big time. On one side, we're seeing the homeowners and we have 65 million of them on house all over the world. We are seeing them doing robust activities. We are at 50% you know, increase comparing to pre-COVID days of remodeling, heavy remodeling activities that are here to stay by the homeowners. And we are also seeing that 2021, it's at five years record high activities. So, so what do they do? They want, Emily, to squeeze every single inch of their homes and make much more out of it. And that's just one piece of the transformation. On the other side, they have right. now high demands. They want to do it all online. They want the technology, they want the software, they want the professionals to provide it here. Now they want to transact online, they want to see everything in 3D. They want to have much more control and visibility of the process. And so House Pro is in the middle of all this, supporting that transformation, demand by the homeowners, and adoption by these professionals. All over the world, we're seeing it. So uh, pending home sales in the US, for example, increasing by the most in a year. If you're not moving, you're redecorating. How is this all driving houses business? Like break down your business for us today. Obviously, I know you have this no pro management software and you not only support consumers, but you support design professionals. Yes, so we do have 2.7 million professionals on house. It's definitely a very big part of our community. And House Pro is an end-to-end -end solution for these professionals and also the core channel for us. 
where from start to finish, we provide the software to the pros to grow their business and manage their business uh, under, uh, under the same roof. And of course, we have these 65 million homeowners that can come to house to find these professionals, to get the inspiration, to shop from house. And again, the entire collaboration is happening there. So both channels, the house pro got an acceleration um, when COVID started to open up things, including all the trends um, that were there before, as well as the e-commerce, of course, that got um, an extra push. This is here to stay. People are reimagining, Emily, their homes, and, and we're seeing big right. acceleration on all fronts for, on both business, for both business lines. What are you seeing in terms of speed? Because I know, obviously, the renovation business is booming, but also things have been slow. There, Things are on back order. There are supply chain issues. There's so much demand. You can't get um, people to move fast enough. You can't hire people fast enough. Are those issues working themselves out? Um, they do. And actually, those that adopt the software and the technology are able to do things much faster and much better for the clients. And this is where we see the adoption, because when you have visibility into what's available in terms of materials and products and labor and cost and where you can get it from and everything is under the same roof, um, it helps a lot in terms of coordination and also to set up the expectation. Gun charts, timeline, this is where I'm saying the expectation and the demand, you're right. It's high and you have to solve this shortage by providing visibility, what is available, where, how, how to get it. Um, and the, the homeowners are demanding it. They, they want it to happen here and now. You're right, professionals are adopting it because you cannot wait okay. anymore. When you are homeowners, you want it now. Uh, what are the, what's the, quickly, Adi, what's the hot new design aesthetic? Is it retro? Is it mid-century modern? Is it classic? Is it something else? You know, it's all over, but we're seeing some trends emerging all over the world. As you know, house is global. We're seeing, for example, the mindset of how, whether you're like transitional, traditional, modern, how do you take something like your backyard or patio or outdoor space before it was just what plants would I plant there and how would I make this garden beautiful? The trends that we're seeing now is how do you make this same outdoor space function as your dining room, gym, uh, a background for your Zoom calls, um, you know, your privacy space to get out of the house where you have other family members inside. So much right. more functionality out of each space. That's the biggest trend right now. <laughs> okay. Adi Tatarko, House CEO and co-founder, Love to hear it. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll have an exclusive interview with Orlando Bravo next. It's not important when uh, any of these space flights go. What's important is that they're ready to go. And, and that's really what you're hearing from us here is, is we're ready. Uh, we had an incredibly successful flight back in May. Uh, we'd announced we were going to run a schedule of four test flights. Uh, the one on May 22nd hit all of our technical objectives and we did deep analysis and looked across all the ships as we prepared for when the time of the next flight would be. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. It is the billionaire space race and Virgin Galactic's Richard Branson is set to beat Amazon founder Jeff Bezos to the great beyond. For more on that, Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow. Ed, we thought that perhaps Branson would pull something out of the hat, and here he is beating Jeff Bezos to the punch. What do we know? Yep, July 11th from New Mexico. I just booked my flights. Branson will go up. And you can see how <laughs> what shareholders thought about it. The stock rises as much as 25% on Friday. By the end of this session, we lost all enthusiasm ahead of the long weekend. But over the course of the last seven days, it's been a roller coaster. Pull up this next board and you can see why. We only just found out seven days ago that they got their FAA license for Branson to do that. A bit of choppy trading in between and then another spike on the news that he would be out Jeff Bezos. Now, you heard in the tape just there from the company's CEO, Cole Glazer, Virgin Galactic CEO, that this had nothing to do with Blue Origin. It was about data. On May 22nd, they did a test. They handed the data over to the FAA. They ticked all the boxes. And it was Richard Branson's decision because they were ready to go. Hmm, I'm not so sure. This is a battle <laughs> of the billionaires. 
Richard Branson's going on July 11th. He has his FAA license to go up. There'll be two pilots and four crew members, including some other staff from Virgin Galactic. Jeff Bezos, he's left waiting to July 20th. And as far as we know, they don't yet have that FAA license. This is turning into an incredible story, Emily. Any chance Elon Musk takes off sometime between now and July 11th and beats them all? I don't know. There's that famous quote. I've said it time and time again. He says he will only get on a rocket when he's sure that he'll die on Mars, not on impact. In other words, he wants to know that his rocket will land safely before he goes into the stars. That said, we don't know who the mystery winner of that auction is for the Blue Origin C. Could be anyone, as far as we know. It was a blind auction, $28 million. Unless you're the bidder, Emily, we just have to wait and find out. Oh, I wish. I wish I could. But, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm enjoying life here on Earth just a little too much. Okay, <laughs> Ed Ludlow, thank you. Thanks so much. All right. Orlando Bravo, founder and managing partner of Toma Bravo, the big private equity firm with $8 billion under management, sat down with our very own Eric Schatzker to talk about crypto and the booming SPAC market. Take a listen to that exclusive interview. What these two big movements are showing us is the need for inclusion in Wall Street and in the financial system by individual investors. So you take Wall Street bets. I read a blog the other day that there was a SPAC sponsor that said, well, my SPAC is not for retail investors. I was like, well, I'm a retail investor. Could it be for me? Retail investors are smart, highly educated. They make good decisions, and they won in the game. And talking about one of the arbitrage situations, they have figured out one of them in the market, and they're doing that very successfully. So, so good for them. Take investing on your own hands, have fun at it, and yeah, they'll take risks, and sometimes they'll make money, sometimes they'll lose money, but I think it's a really, really good thing, and it's really inclusive, and people want that in the world of Wall Street and investing. And, and in crypto, you have a world of young people that want their own financial system and their own culture. And it is very powerful, and I'm a big believer in it. Blockchain technology is completely disruptive. And on top of that, the currencies, they'll be worth more if more people adopt them. And the bet is it's highly likely that more people will adopt them than less. So when there's a Wall Street bets-driven short squeeze, of whatever hedge fund happens to be short, whatever stock. Are you sitting there sort of cheering from the sidelines? I'm cheering uh, so much because I also don't like shorting. I don't, I don't like betting against people. I don't like betting against companies. I don't like the short game. Uh, it's, uh, you're trying to hope somebody does poorly and even spreading potentially bad information that doesn't exist on that company. And this other movement uh, makes hedge funds think about that again. Sometimes that information is good information, sometimes it's real, and sometimes the companies that are being shorted really are pretty lousy companies and maybe worse than that. Maybe they're fraudulent. How do we deal with that problem if there are no shorts? I would say don't buy the stock. Things will figure, figure themselves out, but just don't buy the stock. Our Eric Schatzker there with Orlando Bravo. Meantime, Robinhood co-founders Vlad Tenev and Baiju Bhatt cut their own salaries by 90%, but yet they've still managed to become or will become billionaires if Robinhood's IPO goes well. Joining us now, Bloomberg's Shanali Basik, who's been keeping a close eye on Robinhood since the S1 rolled out. Some details buried in there about how these guys are paid. Shanali, what do we know? Yeah, it's so interesting. So while their uh, pay, their salary was cut by 90% in April to about $34,000, when you take into account their equity awards, what they'll get paid out in the future, they're well over billionaires. So they've really made it into the club of the most rich Americans. And a lot of this was also discovered by my colleague Anders Mellon. It was really great reporting because you know, the, the better Robin Hood does, obviously the better the CEOs do. But, you know, the reason it's also interesting, Emily, is because 
this is the dream, right, in San Francisco to be paid in equity, have a company do well, and cash out on it. I'm sure that the employees also want to be cashing out as well here. Indeed. And look, it's not unusual for CEOs, many CEOs of these big tech companies from Steve Jobs. I believe he had a one dollar salary. You know, they don't get paid a lot in salary, but of course, they're, you know, incredibly wealthy as a result of the equity that they hold in their companies. But the their payouts, does it not depend on how Robinhood's IPO, yeah. how the shares actually perform? Certainly. And it's over a range of time. So uh, the current disclosures are about 16 bucks. But the payouts in the future are uh, based on a range of price targets. And those prices are anywhere from 30 bucks to 300 bucks. So there's a really uh, wide range here on how well Robinhood has to do for them to hit some of these payout targets. What are you hearing, Shanali, in terms of investor enthusiasm? Are they excited about getting in to it's Robinhood, such having a the chance? Great question. I've spent the last two days calling every underwriter I know <laughs> and every investor I know to get a sense of uh, how people feel about it. Super interesting how a lot of these legal issues are being shrugged off. Uh, the lockup periods are a big question mark. Uh, who's going to sell earlier on? Can there be a way to short the stock earlier on? So a lot of questions around the valuation. A lot of people are still baking in what this means, especially if growth starts to plateau a little bit. So a lot of big questions on Wall Street and certainly for the new investors that will be coming in. Well, it would certainly be interesting to see. Uh, it's kind of a meta exercise, right, to see Robinhood itself um, trading on the public markets. And you wonder, are retail investors going to um, set their sights on Robinhood like they have um, GameStop and others? Yeah, it's, it's interesting to ask a question like that, too. And also um, a fun, you know, thought exercise that have been happening, the exposure to crypto you have when you invest in Robinhood stock. You know, Emily, not for nothing, I did look at Coinbase's stock from earlier this year because Coinbase is another company where people were really worried about whether uh, they were going public at the top. And they are, they have declined quite a bit after their early rise. So is Robinhood going to be a similar story or are they going to be sell to these, uh, selling to these new investors that they can continue to be what they've been for them the last couple of years, even with those outages and other um, hiccups we've seen in the last couple months. Interesting. Well, it's certainly going to be a ride every step of the way uh, to that big day and beyond. I know you're going to be covering it every step of the way. Shanali Basik for us. Thanks so much for that report. All right, coming up, drone operator Zipline has raised $250 million to expand its footprint in Africa. Zipline CEO Keller Renato joins us next to talk about how the pandemic has changed its course of history. This is Bloomberg. California-based drone operator Zipline has raised $250 million to expand its operations in Africa, allowing the company to fulfill its demand for services from Ghana to Rwanda. The pandemic has changed the way Zipline is responding globally with the massive need to distribute vaccines uh, across the world, happening as traditional supply chains broke down. Joining us now, Zipline CEO Keller Renato. Keller, great to have you back with us. And you are, in fact, joining us from a production facility in South San Francisco, where it looks like there's drones and planes behind you. What are we seeing there? Yeah, uh, I'm standing in Zipline's manufacturing facility, which is in South San Francisco. So behind me, you can see autonomous aircraft coming off the manufacturing line, uh, getting ready to head to you know, places as diverse as Rwanda, Ghana, Nigeria, uh, North Carolina, or Arkansas. So you know, we're, we're, as you mentioned, we've really seen the pandemic create a, uh, a, a totally new kind of demand for logistic services, particularly instant logistics. Uh, and so we're trying to keep up with that demand. So give us a 30,000 foot view. How many drones is Zipline flying now? Where are they flying and what are they delivering? So uh, Zipline's 
when, when we started in 2016, partnering with the government of Rwanda, we actually initially, you know, our initial service contract was to deliver a wide variety of blood products to 21 different hospitals. Over the last two years, that service has expanded dramatically. Today, we serve about 2,500 hospitals and primary care facilities across Rwanda, Ghana, and the United States. Uh, and then toward the end of this year, we'll also be launching in Nigeria. And we announced last month that Toyota is tapping Zipline to build instant logistics in Japan. So to put, you know, to put that into perspective, I mean, that, that's the largest commercial autonomous system of any kind on earth. A lot of those facilities, hospitals will often order maybe two to five deliveries a day. And so this is a, it's a very new class of logistics for healthcare, where instead of receiving deliveries every month, you can now basically receive what you need, when you need it, in a way that ensures universal access for patients, but also allows healthcare systems to save millions of dollars by centralizing inventory and throwing less stuff out, which is particularly important for precious things like COVID-19 vaccines. Wow. So talk to us about how the pandemic has sort of helped and, ch you know, changed the way your operations have evolved and, and, and responded because um, traditional supply chains really broke down through the pandemic. And now there is a demand and need for vital vaccines and so much more that we didn't have before. Definitely, Emily. I mean, that's what we saw. So uh, I, I think, we, you know, we've depended on traditional logistics for so long. Sometimes I, I think we all forget it, the, the ways in which they are fragile. So, you know, good examples. I mean, Zipline was already serving about, I think, 1,500, 2,000 hospitals and primary care, care facilities when the pandemic struck. But one of the quick things that we, that we immediately recognized was we saw demand for traditional vaccines, for example. These are called EPI vaccines, which is traditional childhood vaccination, went up about 10x in the first month of the pandemic as quarantines were put into place and suddenly a lot of people weren't showing up to work, a lot of traditional logistics who were moving those vaccines was no longer working. And so over the last 12 months, Zipline has delivered over 2.5 million doses of just traditional vaccine, making sure that countries in the middle of a pandemic can keep doing the essential healthcare work that you have to do to keep people healthy uh, and vaccinated. We also immediately began delivering COVID-19 samples from rural areas, uh, to central testing labs to make sure the people who live in those places can get their results in hours rather than weeks. We finally began delivering um, COVID-19 vaccine as soon as it was available, uh, make, ensuring that basically as soon as COVID-19 available vaccine is available in a country, it is available at every primary care facility, no matter how rural or how remote, rather than just being available in urban centers. So this is really the promise of this technology. Wow. It's that we can make logistics work for everybody rather than just people who live in certain zip codes. You forged partnerships with Pfizer, with Toyota, with Walmart all in the last year. Talk to us a little bit about that opportunity ahead to transform the logistics infrastructure, you know, instant delivery, not just for you know, wealthy and, and, and developed countries, but for developing countries that traditionally haven't had access to this. That was really the other half of this transformation that we're seeing as a result of the pandemic. Obviously, a really scary new challenge like this also requires new kinds of technology and new solutions. And so not only did we see the work that Zipline's doing multinationally in Africa really accelerate, but also we've seen some of the biggest, you know, most respected companies in the world, U.S. companies starting to take big bets on instant logistics as ways particularly of providing health care and health and wellness products, making sure that we can deliver those things directly to the home. We've seen every health system in the U.S. is basically, I think so many of these health systems thought that they had maybe 10 years to affect sort of this digital transformation and caring for people in the home. And now a lot of them are accelerating that and trying to do that in one year. So telepresence is one half of the solution so that people can talk to a doctor. The other half of the solution is instant logistics, making sure that a patient can get the exact thing that they need or the thing that they need for their kid uh, very quickly after that initial visit without needing to leave the home. Now, I remember when Zipline launched Keller and there were a lot of folks out there who thought, it would never work. It was before its time. You've had to deal with so many regulatory government issues along the way to get to where you are. Why is it that Jeff Bezos promised an octocopter years ago and that's never happened, but Zipline is here and, and it's big now? 
for sure, there are a lot of companies, I think, that have you know made big announcements in this space. I mean, we take that as a positive. I think a lot of companies are realizing that instant logistics is it's a huge opportunity. It's going to be a big industry. And the thing that's most important to Zipline is it's an opportunity to build the first logistics system that serves all people equally. Uh, I think a lot of people are realizing that building this kind of technology is definitely harder than we initially expected. But I think the most important thing that Zipline really you know, did differently is that we've taken partnering with governments very, very seriously. We know that you know, when it comes to healthcare, most countries have public healthcare systems that you need to work closely with. And when it comes to getting national regulatory approval for these kinds of systems in the way that Zipline has, and that came through these really amazing partnerships directly with countries, with civil aviation authorities, with ministries of health uh, that enabled us to get to the point where we are today, serving about 25 million people. So I think you know there's more credit to uh, the governments we partner with than, than, than to us. Okay. All right. Fascinating. We'll keep watching. Zipline CEO, Keller, Renato, we're going to have to come visit you in South San Francisco sometime. Thanks so much for joining us. Okay. Coming up. Let the celebration begin. Boston Pops is back, and we're going to take a look at one of the world's oldest commissioned warships, the USS Constitution. This is Bloomberg. Fourth of July celebrations are underway and the Boston Pops is back after being canceled last year amidst the pandemic. To celebrate the return, Bloomberg's Janet Wu took a closer look at one of the most recognized symbols in American history, the USS Constitution, the world's oldest commissioned warship, and had a chance to speak with its current chief petty officer about the significance of one of its newly named cannons. The USS Constitution, also known as Old Ironsides, is the world's oldest commissioned warship afloat. We try to have our sailors that give the tours and talk about her, like really bring that history to life. It earned its nickname during the War of 1812, when British cannonballs were seen bouncing off its wooden hull. You don't get to get fully immersed until you're here and until you see all of these guns on our gun deck. One of those 24-pound guns has a new name. I uh, was walking the gun deck one day and I noticed that not all of them were named. Back in 1812 when they had gun teams, they rallied behind something, it was like a mascot. The cannons also needed names because most sailors back then could not read. No records have survived for the original gun names on the USS Constitution. Some have names based on records from her sister ships. Ours, we didn't have that history for the Constitution, so we pulled a little bit here and there, and we've actually gotten to name a few ourselves. And my idea was to name it Perfectus, after Loretta Perfectus Walsh, in honor of women in the military, in the Navy, and in honor of Chief Petty Officers. Walsh was sworn in as the Navy's first female Chief Petty Officer on March 21st, 1917. She was the first female to enlist in any branch of service, and she was the first one to get equal pay and equal rights and equal benefits, which was unheard of in like 1917. Her history is what made my history possible. The naming ceremony, which also coincided with Women's History Month, was streamed on Facebook ahead of the ship's reopening to the public. People are allowed to come on board, they'll get tours, they'll meet our sailors, and they should visit the museum as well. The museum exists to share the stories of old Ironsides, to spark excitement about maritime heritage, naval service, and the American experience. We are so excited that Constitution has more female leaders than she's had in her history, and they have banded together and named a gun in the honor of an early U.S. Navy sailor. These cannons are century-old replicas of the originals, and the newly named Perfectus is one of only two named by the current crew. This is my dream job. Having the chance to even step foot aboard and be assigned to this crew is amazing, and I'm so lucky every single day. I want them to realize how far we've come as a military, not just the Navy, but as a military in, in general, and how much women have strived to overcome obstacles and challenges. Our history in the Navy has grown, and she's kind of grown with us. 
Bloomberg's Janet Wu there. Thanks so much, Janet, for that report. And be sure to tune in to the Boston Pops July 4th Spectacular, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, right here on Bloomberg Television. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Happy Friday, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend and a happy 4th. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Thank you.